for joining us today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others. Well, good evening, everybody. I hope you've had a wonderful Wednesday today. Isn't it good tonight to be in the Lord's house? Tonight it might be better to be in than out. You think? The darkness and the cool weather. This old Florida boy, I've been cold all day. All right. How many of you want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. How many of you want to go right now? Oh, okay. Okay. That's what I thought. Well, we're going to stand and sing that wonderful traditional gospel song when we all get to heaven. Let's sing it together. you brought in here with you, but uh, I'm sure we all brought something, a burden of some kind, somebody that's on our heart. One of our burdens, I know, is uh, just to get back to where we can all be together again without any fear of any other thing, any sickness or trouble I look forward to that don't you I believe tonight we ought to pray that way I think we ought to pray and ask God to get us back to that place where we can all be together the other thing I want us to pray about is I know we're under one roof tonight and uh, I know tonight we have different ideas of the way things ought to be But listen, we are not, after all the things God's brought us through, we are not going to let this divide us. 
We're not going to fault anybody for wearing a mask, and we're not going to fault anybody for not wearing a mask. We're not going to stand in the church and shoot mean looks at one another. We are God's people. We're going to do this right. We're going to take care of those people that that have some underlying health issues and need to take care of themselves. But I'll tell you, if God can bring this church through all that he's brought it through, the last thing we're going to do is fall out in the aisle and fight over a mask. If that starts, we're going to hang a few by the mask off some of these bars in here. We're, we're all family. Let's just stick together and we'll, we'll get through this. Amen. Father, we love you tonight and we thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight. We pray, God, that those that are watching and those that are here and those that are down at the youth house tonight and what's going on there would just all bring honor and glory to you. It is a privilege to worship. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be with our family. And tonight we all have had a burden. We've all brought a burden in. We're a burden for our nation tonight. As we grow closer to this election, we pray that you'd guide us and give us wisdom. Protect us. God, I pray that we, the Christians, those that are fighting the good fight, we won't give up. We won't grow weary in well-doing. We'll keep our eyes on you. And as we just sung about, there's coming a day not very long from now when we all will get to heaven. And out of this group right here, if this was all there was, then somebody in this room is, is next. Somebody's closer to heaven. Life is precious. The Bible teaches us, and you told us it's but a vapor. It's here and it's gone. God, I pray that we'll take full advantage of the life we've been given. I pray for those tonight who are struggling. They're struggling to just keep their head up. They're struggling with depression. They're struggling with having to be inside all the time. God, protect them. Be with them. We thank you, Lord, that we could be here tonight. We thank you for the health and strength to be here tonight. And although we may have to do it differently, there's nothing wrong with that either. We've come together to be with you. We pray that in the coming days that you'll just help us grow closer together. No matter what the crowd looks like, no matter how many may be here or not here or watching or not watching, we are to stay faithful to you. God, tonight, bless our time together. When we leave here, may we just be a little bit stronger in our walk with you than we were before we came. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Good evening, everybody. I want to talk to the kids for just a second, but parents, I need you to perk your ears up. In two weeks from tonight, we're going to start our children's activities back. So at 625 if you would have your child here out into the modular that's where we'll all gather and we're going to start working on a christmas program plus you'll have a time of bible study why the parents are in here so that'll begin at 625 that first week we will have a tryout so if your child can read without assistance they are more than welcome to try out for a part and that will be at six o'clock that night that's october the 7th i'll have a letter for you on sunday that explains all about the christmas play as well as gives practice dates and everything. Let me go ahead and tell the kids about their packets tonight. So salvation is a gift, right? It's a free gift. It's just like someone giving you a package. So tonight we gave you a little bag with some beads in it. And this is gonna be your gift that you get to share with people. The top page of your paper says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that's what we want you to do. We don't want you to be afraid to tell someone about Jesus. So this is a tool that's going to help you to be able to share the gospel with them. So your last page in your paper tells you what you're going to do with those bracelets. There's a little elastic band in there that will stretch. And you're going to put the colors of the beads on. And there's five different beads. Yellow stands for heaven. 
The black bead stands for sin. Red reminds you of the blood of Jesus. The white is when he washes us clean as snow when he takes our sins. And then the green helps us to remember to grow. Keep growing in Jesus, studying the gospel, reading your Bible, prayer, being in church. So we want you to make that bracelet tonight. And then what we want you to do is not be ashamed to share that. So wear that bracelet. And when somebody says, hey, what's that on your arm? Explain it to them and then give it to them so that they can share the gift with someone. All right, so that's what we want you to do tonight. There's also a couple other sheets in there. One that gives you the plan of salvation and then a crossword puzzle or a fill in the blank sheet if you can figure that out. If you don't know, come see Miss Michelle or myself and we'll help you at the end. But we just hope that you've enjoyed this and that you've learned a lot. All right, thank you. All right, very good. One of those sheets that's in the kids' packets tonight that they'll be coloring or playing with or uh, maybe what we did as kids. I hope they don't, but building a paper airplane out of it and seeing how far they can fly it is a verse every one of us really need to live by on a daily basis, especially in the world we're in. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for I'm not ashamed. Romans 1, 16, we confess we are not ashamed. As a matter of fact, we're the opposite of ashamed. We are very thrilled with the gospel and how it has set us free. And uh, we're not so ashamed that we're going to cower down because somebody doesn't agree with us. We are going to confess. Um, how do y'all feel about confession? We've had a little bit of a talk in our office for the last few days, and uh, it got a little deep in there with some strange looks, mostly just by Seth was where the strange looks were coming from. And uh, one of the questions I had was, uh, do you think that when David had sinned with Bathsheba, that he laid awake at night knowing he was wrong, he would admit that he had done something wrong, but admittance is not confession. Would you agree with that? We got to get that in our heart that I may admit I've done something wrong, but that's not a true, true confession. So out of these kids in here, have you kids ever been asked by your mom and dad, have, did you do something? And they were get, trying to get you to admit that you had done it. Have you ever been there? Now you don't have to look at, yep, Mason's got his hand up. I have been there. God bless you, Mason. Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? What they just did was a confession. Hey, right? Uh, who else in here has ever had to do some confessing? Never will forget uh, one Thanksgiving. Is Michelle in here? Okay, I'll tell this then. One Thanksgiving. Michelle makes the best dressing. I'm telling you, it's out of this world, and uh, I love her dressing. And it comes out of that oven, and I just couldn't help it. I, you know, I, somebody's got to sample it. And, and then I drug Alex into it with, with me. And, uh, hey, Michelle, and everything was great. Thanksgiving was great. Nothing happened. And our wife was a sweet, so sweet and so good. Um, bye, Michelle. Well, what happened was we wasn't supposed to be in the dressing. And we had a confession. We had a confession that we'd done it. And it made Thanksgiving a little more like Halloween. <laughs> if you get my drift. It wasn't so sweet around there for a while. She was afraid she wouldn't have enough. We had ate two pieces, I think, maybe a little bit more. As a little boy, I had to do some confessing. You know, for us to be saved, we've looked at the fact that, number one, for salvation, it is necessary that we admit that we've sinned. we got to admit that. How many of you in here tonight believe you're a sinner? Lift your hand up. Good, good, good. We, are, we got that part down. We've all sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory. And a few weeks ago, we had Mark Hyman, although y'all, everybody couldn't see it, but Mark shot those arrows, and... Uh, not every arrow hit the center of that target. And let me tell you, 
The only way you could get to heaven on your own doing, which is impossible, is you'd have to be perfect. You'd never miss the mark. You'd never tell a lie. You'd never do anything wrong. You would never enhance the truth. A lot of times that's what's going on is the enhancement of truth. So some of us uh, in time have done that. We've never stole a minute from the boss over what we should have for our break or for lunch. Uh, we have. We've all come short. We've all missed the mark. we got to admit that. But there's another step going forward. It's more than admitting. It's agreeing with God. And that's something that confession really takes into account. So not only am I saying, yes, I've sinned, but here's what else I'm doing. I'm agreeing with God that it was wrong and that it was sin. Now, here's the deal. David laid on his bed at night knowing what he had done with Bathsheba was wrong, knowing that he had sent a man and murdered him, basically. He knew that. He could admit that. But if we read our Bibles correctly, David had not confessed that. He hadn't had a time with God of confession. David uh, had to have a preacher come by and speak to him, that God had burdened to go by and speak to him. And, and when we read that, when we read a little bit about the concealment of that sin, uh, listen to David. Psalm 32 would say, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I didn't cover up my iniquity. So, yeah, I admitted my sin, and I'm confessing it. He said this, and I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You'll find that in uh, Psalm 32, verse 5. And then you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, when we get saved, we come and agree with God that we have wronged him, that we have sinned, that we have missed the mark. And the beauty of what happens is when we come with true confession. Now, I'm going to get into a few minutes now uh, that there are different kinds of confession. But a true confession, true confession, when you are agreeing with God that you are wrong, when you agree with God that you missed the mark, you agree with God that there's no other way to forgiveness except through him. And take, take a good note of this. There's coming a day we all will agree with God. Right now, you, say, I, you may say, I don't agree with this. I don't agree, I don't agree that that is sin. That's kind of where our culture's at, right? They want to call it something different, and they don't agree that it's sin. And it's amazing how a few years ago something was sin, and now it's not sin. It, and depends on, and here's where it is, it depends on if it's you or not. So a lot of times we've said in the church through the years, and we've looked out and said, I'll tell you what, that's sin. They ought to be ashamed of what they've done, and then our daughter does it, or our son does it, or it happens to us and our family. It don't change the fact that it's still sin, but we don't like to talk about it the same way. We try to give it a little bit, like we said the other day, we try to put icing on that cow patty. And let me tell you, it's still sin. You can't change the heart of what it really is. And I want to tell you today that it doesn't matter what this new age generation is saying. God's not changed his mind on sin. And, it, and one day is coming that we will confess. How, how many of you kids have ever done something and thought you got by with it? Thank you, Mason. Well, Mason, I'll tell you, that boy right there is quick to let us know, ain't he? God bless him. I should have let him teach this lesson. How many of you parents have sinned since virtual school has been part? Uh, some <laughs> grandparents, I've sinned and come short of their glory. Fact of it is, is sometimes we think we've got by with something. Now, let nobody raise their hand on this. Anybody sitting in here tonight that something happened, you could have been a kid, you could have been a teenager, you could have been in your 20s, something happened and you've still never confessed it thank you mason is there anybody else <laughs> listen seriously how many of you took that long years later how many of you has ever, this ever happened you've been sitting around the family table and it's clear now you don't you can't get grounded they can't can't ground you they can't whip you and 
you kind of start laughing and the story gets going. You say, yeah, well, about that. That was me. Um, I've got one that I don't think I ever told my daddy. And when I get to heaven, we'll straighten it out. But I was backing my car out one time. I hit his truck. I did not want to fess up to the fact I hit his truck. There's a dent in my car. He's seen that. You know what I told him? I got hit down at Ingalls. Somebody hit my car at Ingalls. Now, I lied. Is that a lie? That was a lie. Thank you, Mason. <laughs> Mason's with me tonight. And, and I lied. Now, my dad is in heaven right now. I can't go get him and tell him I'd lied about that. It's still wrong. And, you know, we think a lot of times that we've hidden something in our closets that we've pushed something in our life up under the bed, that we've got something that nobody's ever going to know about it. Well, friends, we all know this tonight. He saw it the whole time. It's never missed his eye. The Bible teaches us to repent. The Bible teaches us to confess. Uh, David would also say, when I kept silent, when I would not confess it, my bones wasted away in me. It just weighed on me. It, it, I couldn't live with it. I don't know of a married couple probably that has told each other everything. They can say they have, but it's very doubtful that there's two that have gone to that place where they confessed everything. But one day we've got to stand before God and there will be a, a day of reckoning. There'll be a day of confession and uh, confession's a big deal. What, what's the point? Now, number one, we not only, we've done the ABCs here, but I want us to take confession a little bit deeper tonight for a few minutes. And with the understanding that, yes, with confession of the mouth it's made, you know, when you get saved, you are agreeing with God you've sinned. You are agreeing with God he's the only way to forgive you of your sin. And you're coming to God like you would a parent, and you're saying, I messed up, and I am a sinner and you are a Savior, and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. There's that confession. And you are making confession. So let's ask this question. If you need to confess to be saved, do you need to confess to stay saved? You both say no to that. Do you need to keep confessing and confessing and confessing and confessing? So I got saved when I was eight years old. God gloriously saved me. And here's a doctrine that we follow and the belief we Baptists follow is I was as saved as I could ever get. I got all of the Holy Spirit that I would ever get. And God forgave me. Did you, do you believe that when Jesus went to the cross and died for you, that he died for every sin you have ever committed or you ever will commit? Are we all in agreement with that? I am. So it stands to reason, I did not lose my salvation when I have sinned. How many of you have sinned since you got saved? <laughs> yeah, we all have. We've all messed up since we got saved. Now, God didn't throw us away. Romans 8 is some great teaching on nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And understanding that God... You are his child, and his bloodline flows through you, and he, you've been given new life in Christ, and the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And I've always used this illustration. If one of my children came in and said, I renounce you as my dad, I don't want anybody to know you're my dad, and I, if everybody asks me, I'm going to tell them you're not my dad. And so one of my children can go off in this world and, and, and do something heinous. And people say, well, who's your father? And, uh, and they'll say, I don't have a dad. And say, yeah, you got to have a dad. And is, is John Swanger your dad? And they would say over and over again, no, he is not my dad. And they can denounce that and they can say it's not true and they can say it's not so. But here's the deal. Is it still so? Yes. And if you took me and my children... And we were laid down and they pulled the blood out of us and did a DNA test. It is going to prove 
That is my child, whether they like it or not, whether they'll agree to it or not. And listen to me. When you and I got saved, the blood of Jesus cleansed us from all sin. It washed us clean. The beautiful, wonderful blood of Jesus. And he gave us his life. He, he gave us life. It's amazing how... The power is in the blood and life is in the blood and the blood of Jesus came in and washed us. And let me tell you, when a child of God is, is checked and the DNA is checked, it'll be there. And when we stand before God, the righteous judge, he's not looking for my blood. He's looking for the blood of his son. Has it been applied? That's why they applied it to the doorpost. Has it been applied to your life? And so when we stand up and we say that I'm a child of God, I understand that it's possible. It's possible, is it not, that you have come to church with unconfessed sin in your life? I'm not saying you did tonight, but maybe you did. Any couple in here fall on the way up here? No, you won't raise your hand with that. We don't want to tell everybody, but... Maybe we got in an argument today at some point. Or somebody in McDonald's drive through pushed our wheelbarrow of a car. Did I sin? Yes. Did I confess it to every one of you? But before God as well. At some point, we mess up. Maybe you've had a pretty good day. Is it important, though, when we sin to confess? Is it important to go back before God? What's the point? If you say, well, I've been forgiven of all my sin. You just told me every sin I'd ever commit, Jesus already died for. And I've trusted that and I've believed in that. And so what's the point? Well, let me ask. What was the point of telling your parents or confessing to that, to that wrong you've done? And for some of these kids that... When they were asked, did you do that? And then they say, yes, I did that. Yes. Okay, we've admitted it. We've confessed it. Now, would, would it be possible that there's punishment that follows that, even though they've confessed it? Have you kids ever admitted you've done something wrong and they still give you a spanking? Has that ever happened? Thank you. God bless you, Scarlett. There's one that confesses they did. They did. And that, and that don't, I mean, as kids, we're like, wait a minute. I did my part. I told him, I told him what I'd done. And you know what? We can tell God what we've done. We can confess to God that we've done wrong. But listen, does that mean the consequences of what we've done just goes away? No. We have to pay some, some uh, price for that. Confession and repentance. It's a big deal. First John, I, I want to give you these few verses. And uh, by the way, we've read these verses almost in every one of these studies because they're powerful verses. We call First John 1, 9, the Christian bar of soap is what I've been referred, had it referred to me before. First John chapter 1, verse 9, and then I'm going to back up and read verse 6 through 9. First John chapter 1. And I want to read verse 6, and we'll read down through verse 9. You know the verses. I mean, I'm not telling you anything, but, but I want you to notice a few key words as we walk through these verses. If we say that we have what? Is fellowship. Let's take note of that verse. With who? With him. Fellowship with him. And then we walk in darkness. What are we? Say it out loud. Liars. Who said that? Me or God? Didn't God? Through the pen of John. So here's the deal. If I say that I'm walking with Christ, if I say that I have fellowship with Jesus, and I'm walking with him, I'm a Christian, and then I go walk in the darkness, and I let, what is the darkness, class? What do you see the darkness as? Sin? The world, Egypt, that's the darkness, right? That's when, when we go in the darkness, 
would it be all right if I this be a correct definition that the darkness is opposite of the light? The light of the world is Jesus. When we walk in the darkness, we've walked away from the light and we've gone opposite of where he's at, doing opposite of what he wants us to do. I heard today a story. I, I couldn't believe it myself, but there's a group of people called the progressive Jews. They don't adhere to the old, all the old Orthodox Jewish ways, but if I, if I could help you with what I understand progressive Jews to be, they're liberal Jews, very liberal Jews. And so there was a group met, and uh, this just happened, and they read a portion of the Torah. They, they, uh, and then they have a section of what one of the prophets said. So they may read some of the Torah, but then they'll read a little bit of Isaiah and they'll say a little bit of one of those of Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But, but listen to what this group did. Now, they're disguising themselves as, as some kind of religious belief. But here's what they did. They decided what they would do is replace the words of Isaiah with the words of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so instead of reading scripture, they quoted her and replaced prophetic words with the words of a woman who believed strongly in abortion on demand and did everything she could and wanted to, tried very hard, read some of what she stood for. You'd be alarmed at what she stood for. By the way, she don't believe that anymore. But what she stood for was she thought it ought to be the government's job to dictate to religious groups what they could and could not do. So they got these progressive Jews, can you imagine, can you imagine? Now, here we are as church people, and we say that's awful that they would do something like that. But how much stuff goes on in church on Sunday and doesn't happen in the world on Monday? We say one thing, but we do another. Here's what John is saying. If we say we have fellowship with him, oh, I'm good, I'm walking with Jesus, and then we go walk in the darkness, then we lie. We're lying. And the Bible says, pretty much makes this clear, not only are we lying, we don't do the truth. We're not living the truth. But verse 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Isn't that powerful? Now watch verse 8, though. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We've all admitted tonight, we don't say that. We have sin. We admit that. And then it says the truth's not in us. And then we get to verse 9. But if we confess our sin, verse 9 says. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Confession. Repentance. Admitting we done it wrong. Admitting I made a mistake. How many of you find that hard to do? How many of you find it hard to do? To just admit that you're wrong. I hate that. I, I hate to be wrong. I hate to be told I'm wrong. I hate to eat crow. I hate to sit down with somebody and say, I've done you wrong. It's much easier not to have to do that. It's much easier to live a life where you don't have to do that. And I've been wrong a lot. But the Bible says if I'll confess my sins, he's going to be faithful. He's going to be just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And then verse 10 is even more important. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So what's the big deal of us confessing? What's the big deal if you walked in here tonight and you've already been saved? I mean... Jesus already died for that sin. You've already went to him to be saved. So what's the big deal? Is it important? Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask the kids. When you do wrong in the house, is mama and daddy sweet? 
If you mess up, are they all loving and cuddly and goo-goo? When you break something, is it sweet? Oh, don't worry about that, sweetheart. Break what you want to. Have your free will and break whatever you want to. It's not like that. And for those of us that are married, when the, when the fellowship's broken, it's not a sweet place to be. Any marriages sit in here, you ever, you ever sit in opposite recliners and not look at one another? Stare at the TV for three hours and you don't know what one thing was said? Sit there and just scroll through the phone and pray that they don't say anything? Let's just go to bed. I was told before I got married, my dad said, never go to bed angry. You two never go to bed angry. And I swear to you, when we first got married, we tried to live by that principle. We, we had some all-nighters. We had some all-nighters. And now that we've reached the age we're at, we have a tendency to still doze off, even in the middle of a fight. It's like it's a timeout. We'll finish this in the morning, but good night. I'm so tired. I can't do this anymore. The fact of it is that fellowship's not good. How many of you know it's sweeter during the day when you're texting each other, I love you, I love you too. Hey, what do you want for dinner? Everything's good. You're driving home and you don't dread it. But is there a man in here would admit with me, you've been driving home a lot slower sometimes, taking the back roads. Man, I dread this. Go inside. This is going to be an all-out war. I've done and fouled this up. I messed this up. Maybe... Maybe you've been there, maybe you've not, and maybe you'll never confess it. But we know this, confession and repentance does some things for us. Number one, it causes us to acknowledge before God that we know and we take responsibility for our sin. Instead of me telling my dad that somebody else done it, I should have took responsibility and said, I did that. I made a mistake and backed over that car. How many of you love finding out later that your kids have lied to you? Wouldn't it have been just a whole lot easier if they'd have just told you in the beginning? It's so much easier, kids, if you'll just tell the truth. And I want to give you something that stuck with me. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. Right? If you lie... You're going to have to remember exactly what you said in that lie, and you got to keep it up. And most of us can't keep it up. It's so much easier just to tell the truth. Well, don't this apply to our daily life walking with God? And how many times we think, some reason, we think we can coat that thing differently and God will accept it. We need to acknowledge before God, I know it and I take responsibility for my sin. When I confess my sin, I'm taking responsibility. Number two, it proves we're not trying to hide our sin from God. We're not trying to hide it from others. We confess it and we get it out. How many of you think church would have more revival if we'd confess some things? I'm going to tell you, it's not easy. And I don't know that we can see a great move of God in the church until some of that takes place. People bitter at one another and angry at one another and don't think that that the devil's not going to utilize every tool in his arsenal. Just like what, what, you know, listen, I said it to begin with. We've come too far and fought too many battles. We're not going to let mask or no mask divide us. We still love each other. If we came in here and some of us was wearing hazmat suits, that's just what we'd have to do. Because we're family and we'll do that. Wouldn't you do that for your kids? Wouldn't you do that for your family? You'd go out of your way to protect your family, protect your home. We'd all do that. Well, my friends, this is your family. And we got to go out of our way and do whatever is necessary to keep each other together, to keep going along. And, and so we may have different beliefs on that, but we're not going to fall out and fight about it. And we just need to, to know that let's not hide anything from God. We need to keep an open, repentant life before God. How many of you like, it, how many of you know how it feels that when you're walking with the Lord and you're more tender to it? And so when you do something, you immediately say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. How many of you have done that with God? Sorry. God, I shouldn't have said that. I, I shouldn't have said that. And you have an immediate time of repentance. You go straight to that person and you say, I, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said what I said. Let me tell you what. If you're a true child of God and you wrong somebody or you say something wrong, 
it's going to get it's going to hit you here's the problem when you when you don't deal with it you start building up calluses and you'll find it easier and easier to just let stuff go and then you become this hateful person who who won't admit anything won't confess anything and 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 it just starts building and you know what when we confess our sin it humbles us it, it'll humble us number three this is what else confession will do it shows that we are asking for and we're relying on god's strength to help us change so when i confess before god it is saying to god i i know what i just did was wrong help me do a better job with that boy i'm i can just use me as an example but This is, this is the way it is, especially, you know, in, in what I do, standing here and preaching. There are times I just need to learn from it. I, sometimes the best I try, John still gets involved. Sometimes John jumps in front of Jesus. And that's the danger of having the platform is you can say, wait a minute, Lord, sit down. I got something I need to say, and then I'll let you come back and finish. And if we're not careful that we live that, I listen, when, if I'll admit, God, just help me. Help me not do that. Help me, help me be more sensitive to that. Help me to understand things better. See, what it's doing is I confess what I did was wrong because, God, I jumped in front of you. That was me. That wasn't you. I should let you be living out in me. And I'm relying on your strength to help me change. So when I go confessing to God, I'm saying to God, I, I'm, I'm being truthful now in my confession. I'm going to give you an example or two here in just a minute of what's not a true confession. But when we're being real with our confession, we're saying to God, help us. And you know what else it does when I'm continuously confessing and repenting of my sin? It allows me to be continually healed. There's healing in it. And I tell you, when you've got unconfessed sin in your life, it's an open wound. You won't heal properly. And we go to God to, to, to break down that wall, break down that barrier that's broken. Listen to me. Not broken our relationship. It has broken our fellowship. I'm always his son. But sometimes the father has a problem with the son. Because the son got out of line. And I need to fix that. And it's got to be fixed. Most importantly, fifthly, this most important, confession and repentance sustain our loving relationship. It, it keeps things sweet, keeps things going. I know that I'm a child of God, but I also know that sometimes I, I get out of line. It matters. We confess and repent because we want to be in continual in an intimate relationship with God. So let me ask any kid. We've had some hand raising in here. Our kids are in here. How many of you enjoy spankings? Mason? I'll have to tell his daddy. He enjoys spankings. How many of you like ice cream more than whippings? There we go. How many of you enjoy when the parents are saying, you know what? You've been good, so I'm, I'm going to let's go get a prize for you being good we like to be rewarded when we're doing it right we like to be rewarded none of us like the weapons so uh, here's the deal is it possible to have a confession and it not be true in other words have any of us ever said Okay, I did it, I did it, I did it, I did it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is that true confession? Or are we trying to get out of the whipping? How many of us have done some flat-out confessing when we got found out what we were doing? I think sometimes our confession takes on different ways. Remember Pharaoh? And Moses is standing there with Pharaoh. And in Exodus 9, 27, Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned. Why would he do that? Why would Pharaoh say he has sinned? Is he truly repenting of what he had done? Is he truly confessing? 
He said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and me and my people are wicked. That's what Pharaoh said. We're wrong. We, we're wicked. Well, what was going on? Sounds like a good confession, don't it? It wasn't a good confession. It's what's called a horrified confession because they were in fear of what was going on. And if you look at the context and go back and look, you'll see that the Lord said to Moses, stretch forth your hand toward heaven that there may be hell in. Hailstones started falling. The land of Egypt was eat up with hailstones. And that's why Pharaoh said, I have sinned. I have sinned. Reckon this goes on in the church? You ever think there's been horrified confessions in people's lives? Oh, God, if you'll just get me out of this, I'll serve you until my final day. You ever been on a plane that is experiencing amazing turbulence? When the whole thing's bouncing? One time I've been in it like that. And let me tell you, you do some thinking. You do some thinking, man. You don't know how something that big is just being tossed around like a child's toy. And we'll sit there and think all kind of thoughts. How many of us have said, oh, God. Oh, if, that, if this don't happen, oh, God, if you'll just not let this happen, I promise you I won't do it again. And if you'll follow Pharaoh after this, when the hailstones stopped falling and everything calmed down, you know what he did? He hardened his heart. He went right back to the way he was living. How many people do you know have done that? How many of us have done that? How many people have walked down the aisle and had a horrified confession? Oh, Lord, if you'll just get me out of this. Many people have made a promise to God, and it, and it wasn't what they meant. I can't tell you in 20-some years of pastoring how many times I've had somebody come in my office, sit down in front of me, blubbering and crying. Oh, I've lost it. I've lost it all. I've done something horrible, Pastor. I need your prayers. I need to get things right. I'm telling this has happened more than once. My wife has left me. She's so angry. I would do anything to get her back again. I got to get my life in line. I got to get in the church and, and I need to do better and I got to do better by her. And then that home might come back together for a little bit. And, and, uh, what happens? Sometimes it, it they go right back to what they're doing. Now, what was that confession? Was that a true confession? What do you think God's looking for out of us? Horrified confessions? Oh, God, don't take my money. Oh, God, please help me. Wonder how many horrified confessions have been prayed through COVID. How many Americans have been saying, oh, God, if you'll just get this stuff away from us, if you'll just get this away from us, I'll do better, God. I won't live like that anymore. Hmm. When the Bible says if we confess our sins, it doesn't mean to admit our sins. That's what Pharaoh was doing. Pharaoh admitted his sin, but he did not confess his sin. And see, for us to truly be right with God, there has to be a true confession we need to be true with it we ought to be broken hearted about what we've done we've broken the heart of god and i know as a child i had a few horrified confessions but as i got older i really saw how it broke my parents heart it's different and if we can get to that place with god in our life what about saul y'all remember saul king saul and remember when he was told to go in and not leave one thing alive? The Malachites were supposed to be completely wiped out. And you remember what he did? He kept back some of those animals and he kept the king alive. And when, and, and when the prophet comes in, he says, what happened here? Why do I hear the bleeding of sheep? You're supposed to kill everything. God told you to wipe them out. That's what God said. He said, but I'm going to use the animals for sacrifice. Huh. Now, what kind of confession have we got here? Now, that's half-hearted confession. Saul was not wrong or, or feeling that bad about what he had done. He believed he had an alibi. Saul would say, I'm not really that bad. I did it. I admit it. I admit I kept some alive, but wait till you hear my side of it. I wonder how many people are, are going to go to thinking they're going to go to God with that very thought. Wait till God hears my side of it. See, God, I just don't think God understands. I know what he said. I know what God said, but wait till he hears my side of it. See, this is kind of where a lot of people are living right now. They always have an alibi. 
Well, it's not my fault. It's the way I was raised. God, it's not my fault. It was my mom and dad's fault that I did what I did. Aaron, uh, remember old Aaron? Him and Moses. Moses was gone. Aaron made a golden calf. I find this to be one of the funniest verses in all the Bible. Aaron, what have you done? Moses said, what have you done? He said, well, the people's heart is being on mischief. It's their fault. Don't that sound like the way people are? It's not our fault. It's their fault. And he said, I just put the gold in the fire and out came this calf. I mean, that is one of the funniest verses in all the Bible. Can't you see my bat in his eyes saying, I don't know what happened, Moses. They were just being on mischief. And they started bringing me all this gold and I fed it into the hopper. And you, would you believe this is what come out? We didn't mold it, touch it or nothing. This is just what come out. <laughs> now, how many of us, when we're confessing we've done something wrong, how many of you kids, now you don't have to say it out loud, but how many of us as kids, we still do it time to time, did you do that? Yeah, I did it, but it's not my fault. They told me to do it. And then we got this. Yeah, there we go. They told me to do it. And then you'd say, well, if they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? <laughs> we always get that. And that, that, but, but that's the way a lot of times we come in. Well, it's not really my fault. I was with a group of friends and, you know, I, I didn't want to, didn't want to offend them. I didn't, you know, and, and, and it just happened. It just happened. And that becomes that half-hearted confession. We got to be careful with our confession. And all of us remember Achan, don't we? And the Bible says that all the loot that they took, and Achan was a warrior, and all the loot that they took from the war they won, it was supposed to be given to God, brought into the temple. But you know what he did? Achan went and hid some. He, he hid some. Uh, he didn't think anybody would find it. And then this is the famous phrase out of the Bible. There's sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. God saying, I will not protect you. You will not win battles because there are there's sin in the camp. And that better be confessed. Nobody would confess. So they got together and the Bible says they had some lot casting. Basically, in our day, what happened is the Holy Spirit of God pointed a finger at exactly the one. And they go to the tent of Achan and they discover that he had stole some stuff. And you know, you would think, well, listen. Poor old Aiken. He shouldn't have done what he'd done. And, and really, we ought not be so harsh on him. I ought not be so harsh on him. And I can't help it tonight. A little of this just got to come out. That sounds so much like this mamby-pamby liberalism of our day. I recently heard a major candidate say, major candidate said this, we need to stop building prisons. And people who get caught doing drugs, we need to build more therapy centers. They need to go into rehab. That's the way we'll fix this. We'll fix them by putting them in rehab. Rehab is great. I'm telling you, they're strong rehab centers. But listen to me. A crime is a crime. And in our country, if we start saying crime ain't crime, we're all in trouble. They can just take our stuff and rob us and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's what Achan, what, what happens to the people of God standing there? Achan has violated God's law. And, and what does, what happens? Here's what Joshua said in Joshua 7, 20 and 21. Joshua said, all right, that we found it out where the sin was in the camp. Now bring stones and stone him, stone his family and all that he has and burn them with fire. And that was after he had said, I've sinned. This is a confession with Achan. It was a confession It was too late. Achan had his opportunity to say, it's me, it's me. I'll get rid of this. I shouldn't have done this. But because he thought he'd keep hiding it, and he pushed it back, and he pushed it back, and he pushed it back, then it became too late for Achan. And so he had a confession that was too little, too late. I think of Ananias and Sapphira. And they were called in. And all they had to do was say, we kept some of the money. But they had already decided we're going to lie about it. And they lied. They wasn't both in the room together. And the next thing you know, 
drops dead. They pull his body out and they bury him. And his wife comes in a little while later and they ask her the same question. And it's already determined in her heart. I'm not going to confess what we've done. We kept back some of this. And imagine her thought that just goes through her head when they said, okay, the same thing's getting ready to happen to you. We just buried your husband. Let me ask you all something. Let's be real about this. If our God wasn't as merciful as he was and still did that to the church, would we have anything left? How merciful God is to us. What a merciful God we're serving tonight. Well, I wanted to read you a story to close of Adrian Rogers because I found this. You never think little Adrian ever done anything wrong. When he was a little boy, they lived on Florida Avenue in West Palm Beach, Florida. He said, that's back, I was in first, second, third grade, somewhere around in there, and really before he even started school, they were living there. And he said, one day, before I'd even started school, I was out there playing in the street, playing in the road, traffic everywhere. My mother said to me, Adrian, do not play in the street. If you play in the street, you're in big trouble. You'll be punished. He said, there's a lot of traffic on that street, but he proceeded. He went out there and he played in that street. He said, I was a disobedient boy, and I went right out there. He said, but I had an older brother who was a tattletale. Anybody in here got a tattletale living with you? Thank you, Mason. God bless you. Little tattletales in the house. You can't get by with nothing because they tell on everything. Adrian Rogers had a brother that's a tattletale, so you kids don't feel so bad. He said, uh, I knew it. I was due judgment, and in our family, it was going to happen. It would happen swift, and it would be painful. Listen to as he describes it. He said, so I went to hide. We lived in a two-story house. I went up the back stairs, up the stairwell, and a bedroom to the side. I went in that bedroom on the left-hand side. That bedroom was on the left-hand side, he said, and I hid under the bed. Just went right under that bed. He said, I heard my dad's voice. Adrian, I didn't answer. Adrian, I didn't answer. Buddy, you know where Adrian is? No, sir. Well, he's bound to be in this house somewhere. He said, I could hear my dad's foot, footprints going up and down those stairs. I'm under the bed upstairs. Boom, boom, boom. My heart's beating. Then I heard my dad coming up the stairs. I heard my dad go in the bedroom on the other side. I heard him open every closet door. I heard him as he said, look under the bed. He looked under the bed in that room. Then I heard him as he stopped past the middle bathroom and looked in there. And then I heard his hand on the doorknob coming into the bedroom where I was. Some of us are living a nightmare right now. Do you know what this preschooler did, Adrian Rogers said? I came out from underneath that bed. I brushed the dust off and I said, Dad, I need to talk to you. I said, Dad, do you remember when you told us if we ever did anything wrong, that if we come to you and we confess it, we were truly sorry you wouldn't punish us? Do you remember that, Dad? Well, Dad, I want to tell you I was out playing in the street. <laughs> he said, my friend, I got one of the worst whippings I ever did get. My dad had no mercy. What went wrong? Well, you know exactly what was wrong. Here I was waiting until there was no way out, no possible hope. Judgment was coming. There's no doubt he would have looked under that bed. And there's that little kid there. He said this, I wasn't broken hearted that I disobeyed my dad. I really wasn't even seriously concerned about the danger of a child playing in the road. I just didn't want a whipping. And I felt that if I said, Dad, I've done wrong, somehow I could fool my dad. How much less would you fool your heavenly father? And let's understand tonight, if we're not careful, a lot of our confession is that kind of confession. We think we can hide it by coming to church. We think we can hide it by singing along with the songs. But that's not true confession. True confession and what puts us back into fellowship with the holy God is when we're broken hearted about what we've done. 
I live that. I always find it interesting now that the last place my dad gave me a whipping was also the last place that he gave me a full sentence and hugged my neck and cried on me right before he died. Was out in that barn. Had I done wrong? Yes. Had he told me I shouldn't have done those things? Yes. I had done it. I was wrong. But I'll never forget. I think I was 16. I cut my own hickory. He told me to. I brought it back in the barn. He whipped me with the hickory. And as I started out of the barn crying, I turned around and he was crying. And let me tell you something. I made a decision. I never want to see that again. He is crying because of what he had to do to me. Listen, our confession will never be right until we look to the Heavenly Father and understand what he went through so that you and I could have forgiveness. And we should never want to see him hurt over what we've done. Right? And I know when you become a parent, You become a parent, you occasionally find yourself picking up the phone, calling your parents and saying, sorry about that. I'm paying for it now. Because you don't realize the emotions you're going to have. How bad it hurts to have to spank your children. But listen, when the spanking's over and you can go crawl up in your mama's lap or your daddy's lap and they hug you, Nothing sweeter than that. Amen. I love you guys. And uh, kids, tonight, if there's anything you're hiding, this would be a good night for confession. <laughs> They're like, I ain't telling. You talk them whipping stories. It ain't happening here. Oh, boy. It's tough. We're God's children. We find ourselves in those tough situations. Well, I hope you have, listen, uh, next Wednesday night, it is our plan, and we, we say night, but everybody's welcome. Everybody is welcome. But here's what we're going to do. We're just going to open up the grounds. Well, our plan is to have a bonfire going. Kids, bring your bikes. Uh, bring, just, just, we'll have the big parking lot, and we're going to just have a time of fellowship. A, a night, a family night. And so if you get off work at 5 or 5.30, go by. We're not cooking. Uh, but you can go by and pick you something up to eat. And bring it on up here. And uh, let's just sit around. We're going to have marshmallows ready and sticks. And and uh, one thing that, you know, COVID's done is this kind of separated everybody. And uh, we'll be outside. This is all weather permitting. We'll start, like I said, come on up 5, 5.30. People be coming in. And the kids can ride their bikes and play. And this uh, this week, our deacons met, and we've made a very clear decision to uh, put a new playground up here. Uh, we're getting uh, we're getting we're on that already. Uh, we're going to build a picnic shelter, a covered shelter. We'll have picnic tables in it. We got the prettiest grounds here, and uh, we want to give our kids a place to play. And give them a safe place to come. The picnic shelter be available. You can come do birthday parties. And um, we sat here together the other night, and we won't invest in our families and our kids. And and we're not done looking at building plans, but COVID has kind of put a stop on everything as far as how far we move ahead. Um, so we're willing to do whatever it takes. We're going to put a nice playground in. We're going to put a nice picnic shelter in, and uh, we're going to have a place that's uh, for family and children and the family of God. So next Wednesday, it's it's open to everybody, not just family and kids, but bring one of your chairs. We'll sit around and uh, laugh and talk and uh, just have a good time. And and uh, like I say, we'll roast a marshmallow and and we'll just have fun. All right, that's next Wednesday. We'll we'll make sure we send out some more announcements because we're heading pretty quick. You can tell we're heading real quick to when it gets dark so quick. And uh, 
you know, it'll be too cold before long, but it might warm right up on us for next week. I don't know. So let's, let's do that. Let's come together. Bring your cornhole boards. We'll get down there. We'll gamble. We'll throw cornhole. Uh, $100 to the winner, each one. So let's have a good time. Love you guys. Have a good night. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart and you desire to serve him and to worship him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together.